fucking good. All you'll ever be. In 1912, one of the most important pioneers of early film, D.W. Griffith, made a short called Man's Genesis, about two cavemen fighting over a cave woman. This is usually cited as the first example of an entire subgenre of sci-fi fantasy known as the quote, primitive man picture, unquote. And the short was beloved in its day for its technical achievements, but decried by some for its hinting at man's primate origins. The subgenre would maintain a small but popular niche in pop culture, reinforcing anachronistic stereotypes like cavemen and dinosaurs living together, and the ever-popular portrayal of prehistoric sexism involving men clubbing women to take back to their caves. D.W. Griffith would revisit the Primitive Man film many times, and in 1940 he co-produced One Million B.C., which stars Victor Mature, Carol Landis, and Lon Chaney Jr. While not universally praised in its day, 1 million BC proved popular enough that, in the midst of the swinging 60s, a booming British studio decided it was ripe for a remake. After a fight over sustenance, the warrior Tumak is exiled from the savage rock tribe and left for dead by his own father, Akoba. Stumbling deliriously through the dinosaur-infested wilderness, he is eventually found by Loana of the Shell Tribe, who nurses him back to health and shows him what life could be like when humans work together in peace. However, after getting into another fight with one of the Shell tribesmen, Tumak is again exiled, with Loana following not far behind. He returns to the Rock Tribe to find Akoba badly wounded, and Tumak's brother, Sakana, leading the group with an iron fist. He tries to show them the better way of life he learned from the Shell people, even teaching them how to make weapons. But it all goes wrong when Sakana feels his power threatened. By the mid-1960s, Hammer Film Productions was one of the most well-known movie studios based outside of the United States. It had a reputation for making high-quality B-pictures, salacious horrors in direct competition with the universal classic monsters, and other genre flicks that critics enjoyed less than audiences. However, with the rise of independent films around the world, and The Hays Code having fallen by the wayside in America, Hammer's niche was beginning to show early signs of decline, so the studio cast its net to other genres, and in 1965, it produced an adaptation of She, starring Ursula Andress and John Richardson, alongside Hammer staples Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. She was an international financial success, so Hammer was looking for a follow-up, which is when the studio got the rights to 1 million BC, had producer Michael Carreras write a screenplay, brought in special effects legend Ray Harryhausen, and hired Don Chaffee, well known for Jason and the Argonauts, to direct. Hey, do you have a sci-fi classic you want me to cover? Drop it down in the comments below, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support what I do even more, please consider joining my Patreon to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. If you still haven't gotten enough of me, I'm also the co-host of a couple of different podcasts, The Streaming Heap and From Here to Paternity, which are available wherever you get your podcasts, and I have a novel called Paradox that is available through Amazon. If all else fails, though, you can always check out my website at emcgill.com, where you'll find written reviews of plenty more science fiction classics in both film and literature. Now then, with all that shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's move on. The role of Loana, the female lead, was initially offered to She star Ursula Andress, though Andress turned it down over salary concerns. Due to a distribution deal with 20th Century Fox, though, the American studio was able to loan out one of its contracted actors, Raquel Welch, who had just made a splash in Fantastic Voyage. Welch wasn't enthusiastic about a quote, silly dinosaur movie, unquote, but she agreed because she thought it would be fun to spend a couple of months in mid-60s London. However, she spent much of her time on location in the Canary Islands, in the bitter cold of winter. 
Due to her, let's say, less than sufficient wardrobe, she got brutally sick with a nasty case of tonsillitis. When she got back in the studio, she chose to do her own stunts and fight scenes with her female co-star, two-time Bond girl Martine Beswick, who plays Nupande. The male lead, Tumac, is played by John Richardson, whose only previous screen credit was alongside Ursula Andress in She. Richardson and Martine Beswick would fall in love on set, leading to their six-year marriage that started in 1967. Meanwhile, Tumac's chief rival in the film, Sakana, is played by genre veteran Percy Herbert, known for his roles in The Bridge on the River Kwai, Quatermass 2, and Mysterious Island. Up the gully, Roger! Fifteen on a dead man's For the pair's domineering father, Akoba, they hired Robert Brown, who would later succeed Bernard Lee as M in the James Bond films. Brown's makeup was designed to be nearly identical to the makeup worn by Lon Chaney in the original film. Location shooting began in late 1965 in the Canary Islands, specifically Lanzarote and Tenerife, where cast and crew had to work around snow and frost. It wrapped in early 1966 after the studio work, and Harryhausen's extensive effects shooting continued until early spring. Now, there's an entire Wikipedia article devoted just to Raquel Welch's fur bikini in the film, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Suffice it to say, one day on set when Welch was wearing one of the three bikinis made for her, a photographer took a picture that would go on to be a cultural landmark, cementing Welch's status as a sex symbol. Hammer even put the image on a series of Christmas cards it sent out that year, and incorporated it into the film's poster and promotional materials. The image, as it turns out, is more famous than the movie itself. Raquel Welch in a fur bikini, though, isn't the only eye candy in the film. Ray Harryhausen incorporated his Dynamotion stop-motion technique, though copyright prevented the term from being used, to realize most of the oversized creatures in the film. It was Harryhausen's idea to also include a few shots of live-action creatures like the iguana near the beginning of the film, with the idea that it would help audiences accept the reality of his stop-motion creations, an experiment he would later admit didn't work as he'd hoped. However, for the stop-motion animals, he did base them on real ones, such as the Archelon, the Pterodon, and the juvenile Allosaurus. Though perhaps not terribly up to snuff today, these creatures are some of the only aspects of the movie that are approximately accurate to the scientific understanding of the 1960s. One Million Years BC, released on December 30th, 1966, in both the UK and the US, with the US version missing nine minutes to appease American censors in that weird period between the Hays Code and the MPAA Ratings Board. The movie got surprisingly good reviews, even though critics couldn't help but offer obligatory dismissals of such genre entertainment, and it was a box office smash hit, giving Hammer Films the green light to produce several more primitive man films like Slave Girls, aka Prehistoric Women, The Lost Continent, and When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. Other studios would jump on the short-lived primitive man bandwagon well into the 1970s, and though One Million Years BC is hardly the only notable movie in the subgenre around that time period, it is the most successful and well-remembered, even if its most lasting legacy is a quintessential pinup poster. Footage from the movie also crops up in other films, like A Clockwork Orange and War Games. Before I get to my own opinion on the film, let me address the question of whether or not a movie like this qualifies as science fiction. Whenever I cover anything with naturalistic overtones like King Kong or The Lost World, I inevitably have people in the comments telling me that those aren't science fiction. Personally, I disagree, as science is, at its core, a way of making sense of the natural world. Any fiction that deals with things like evolution, therefore, is sci-fi, even if it doesn't have the computers, laser beams, robots, and aliens we usually associate with the genre. That said, it's hard to argue that there's much actual science in one million years BC. Dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, 
and Homo sapiens didn't emerge until around 300,000 years ago. And of course, real so-called cavemen didn't look anything like this. Even if you did their hair all nice, gave them manicured costumes and dental work, and touched them up with absurd amounts of makeup. These, though, are all long-standing genre trappings of the time, which you either accept or you don't, with science having little place in the conversation. But is it really any less quote-unquote realistic than futuristic sci-fi where everybody speaks colloquially modern English and wears present-day clothing? Not really. The entire concept of the caveman came from scientists doing their best to look beyond written history. So the reason why I resolutely fall in the sci-fi camp when it comes to something like 1 million years BC is that it is using concepts born from science to comment on human nature. All good science fiction does this, and 1 million years BC is no exception. The core struggle of the film isn't particularly subtle, showing that humanity has always battled with its primitive instincts towards selfishness and violence, that even when we are shown a more peaceful way of coexisting with our fellow man, we must work hard to overcome the animal within. Without getting drawn into a well-worn philosophical debate about the inherent nature of man, I do like how the conclusion of the film doesn't lend itself to a simplistic moral where Tumac wins through peace instead of war. After all, he still stabs his brother in the end. However, I can't go so far as to say One Million Years BC is a great film. It has its charms and spectacle, to be sure, but it's also a bit of a slog to get through. I admire the film for almost entirely doing away with spoken dialogue, with what dialogue there is being spoken in unsubtitled, easy-to-figure-out primitive gobbledygook instead of English, something the original movie can't claim to have done. That doesn't make it any less exhausting to sit through, though, with its hour-and-a-half runtime feeling more like three hours. I also don't like the deus ex machina volcano eruption at the climax, but that's more of a commentary on those aforementioned genre tropes than on this movie in particular, as I can list dozens of these kinds of movies that all end the same way. Still, one Million Years B.C. does stand above a lot of schlock caveman flicks, and even some of the painfully navel-gazing serious caveman dramas that would come later, as an indisputable sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What's your favorite primitive man-style movie? Let me know in the comments, and here's another reminder to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you for watching! And until next time, when we'll discuss another 1950s sci-fi classic that was remade in the 80s, this is the Unapologetic Geek telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody. <laughs>